Okay, welcome everyone to the American Cetacean Society, San Francisco Bay Chapters, September 2023 speaker event. And I'm Susan Hopp, board member responsible for our speaker program. And first of all, for anyone new to the American Cetacean Society, we are a chapter within a national organization that is the oldest nonprofit dedicated to the protection of whales, dolphins, porpoises, and their habitat. And we do this through education, community engagement, and awarding grants towards cetacean research. And of course, we appreciate your donations in support of our mission because it's the donations that fund our research grant to scientists and support our expenses around these monthly talks. And it's easy to donate on our website if you haven't at time of registration. So thank you. Now we are recording this session and please put questions in the Q&A. That's actually better than the chat. And after the presentation, uh, we'll do our best to get to them. Now for our subject at hand, tonight's talk is The Secret Life of Harbor Porpoises, New Insights into Mating Behavior and Implications for Conservation. And all that's really to say is we're gonna learn about the sex lives of harbor porpoises and our guide is our very own board member and marine biologist, Mark Weber. So a little bit about Mark. He is currently a cetacean field research associate at the Marine Mammal Center, an organization he has worked with extensively with stranded marine mammals going back to 1976. His current research is on the cetaceans of the San Francisco Bay Area, harbor porpoises, bottlenose dolphins, gray whales and humpback whales, even as he continues his lifelong fascination with pinnipeds through several ongoing projects. And Mark spent 30 years with the US Fish and Wildlife Service in the National Wildlife Refuge and Marine Mammals Management Programs. His last assignment was as deputy manager of the 4 million acre Alaska Maritime National Wildlife Refuge, which is home to more than 60% of North America's breeding seabirds and provides habitat for numerous pinniped species. His field work has taken him around the world from Antarctic to the Arctic and the Pacific Coast whale migration paths are regular expeditions. He is a contributing author on anthologies of marine mammals, their behavior and habitats. Tonight, we will be treated to a sneak preview of his chapter contribution in a comprehensive new book, Sex in Cetaceans, Morphology, Behavior, and the Evolution of Sexual Strategies. So Mark, thanks so much for um, being here tonight and um, can't wait to all that we're about to learn. So I hand it over to you. Thank you, Susan. I appreciate that introduction and uh, send my welcome greetings out to everyone out there. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, very pleased to have this opportunity to talk to you and go over some of the fascinating things we've learned about this, what would seem to be commonplace small cetacean in our world, those of us who enjoy uh, whale watching and porpoise and dolphin watching along the coast of, well, of all the Northern Hemisphere continents, uh, uh, yet we, uh, as this journey has advanced, realized how little we knew about them uh, not very long ago. There's been a lot of work done, but there are major holes in our understanding and our knowledge. One of the reasons uh, why is they're a rather shy and elusive creature. They they tend to avoid us um, when we're in our power boats uh, offshore. Uh, so novel methods and approaches are needed. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about some that have come along and are pretty exciting and generating amazing insights. So um, yes, I'm a part of the Marine Mammal Center and also I'm affiliated with the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco and, and very much appreciate support from both those organizations. The Marine Mammal Center is, well, the largest marine mammal hospital in the world. Uh, and I got my start there, uh, helped launch my career in, in uh, science by learning about these animals firsthand, quite literally, um, working with veterinarians and uh, specialists to help rehabilitate animals that would come in on our shores sick and injured, in which they continue that mission today. And I'm back involved with them again some 40 plus years later uh, because they built out uh, a field research component to their projects. And so um, 
a number of us joined them, uh, including uh, Bill Keener, who was on the cover slide as having taken a, a ton of these pictures, a great friend and research partner for uh, almost all that time uh, So um, that I've been involved with marine mammals. Uh, so very uh, pleased to have the chance to return to the Marine Mammal Center and uh, help them build uh, out new program ideas for their, um, their contributions to marine mammal conservation. So great news, uh, just <laughs> yesterday, uh, our the book Susan alluded to, the book that uh, we have a chapter in uh, with our great, great friends and, and wonderful scientists, Berent Versig and Dara Orbach, who are the editors, this book is available. And if you look in the chat, you're gonna find a link to it. It's free, it's open access. This is like you know something that would be $150 in most normal cases in print. Uh, funding was raised uh, very, uh, creatively and extraordinarily by, by the team of editors. And uh, lo and behold, we have the access to all this wonderful science. I'm, I'm reading a lot of it. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff I um, am really enjoying catching up on and learning about new developments because it covers all cetaceans. Uh, we just have this piece, uh, one chapter on porpoises and uh, there are chapters on just about everybody else. So I invite you and encourage you if uh, you want to carry on learning about um, our work and uh, about this topic in, in cetacean biology and behavior, um, you can go right to it. All right, so um, I also wanted to start, uh, this is particularly poignant for our SF Bay chapter folks that are with us tonight. We, we lost two amazing uh, supporters of ACS San Francisco and marine mammal science and research and, and our own projects uh, over the last years, and I uh, just want to dedicate this talk to both Izzy Shapaniak and uh, John Stern, both of whom were instrumental in um, all the things you're going to see to do with everything that happened in San Francisco Bay, uh, which I'll use as a prelude to the newest work. Uh, we we uh, just got into the book chapter. Um, John was the one really who discovered the porpoises in the bay. Izzy had been working on them with us, with Bill Keener and myself, for, for many years did his master's thesis on the use of the Gulf of the Farallons by these porpoises. Uh, and um, they just found their way back and John found them. And, and by the way, the little illustration is in because that's a contribution from our good friend Uko who made an illustration of, of John. So I thought I'd share that today too in our um, remembrance of them and, and joy they brought to us and, and um, incredible contributions scientifically. So let's talk about our study subject for tonight, the harbor porpoise. Um, it's a, one of the smallest cetaceans, uh, five to six feet long, sorry, not metric there, 150 pounds. Uh, they notice the next fact, they live a relatively short life. Uh, many cetaceans live many decades, some um, possibly even hundreds of years in the case of bowhead whales. These animals do not. Um, their average life expectancy is 10 to 12 years. And there was a paper written about this and it had the uh, interesting title of Life in the Fast Lane. Uh, these porpoises mature early. They uh, give birth uh, in many areas every year. Um, so they have to get their life uh, functions done quickly in order to replicate themselves and keep their populations going. Uh, nobody knows exactly why. Uh, they're a small animal in a colder environment, but there are plenty of other smaller marine mammals as well in colder environments. So it's just a interesting curiosity about their, their life story. Uh, they're in a family of porpoises. It's all porpoises. Uh, there are three subspecies of harbor porpoises, and I'll show you uh, what all those porpoises look like in a second. There are actually three subspecies of harbor porpoise, however, and they're found right off our, our coast in uh, uh, north, uh, the North Pacific, off the eastern North Pacific, and parts of the western North Pacific, for that matter. They're on both sides of the Atlantic, and there are populations in the Black, that's a separate subspecies, and the Baltic Seas, which is a group that's part of the Atlantic subspecies. So three isolated subspecies that don't um, mingle, certainly not any longer, uh, in different oceans and seas. Uh, and that'll be a, another fact we'll come back to a little bit later as to um, how these animals, um, how their lives have progressed, their evolutionary lives have progressed, and uh, the, the mating um, behavior of this, this animal. So they're a coastal animal, as I mentioned earlier, we see them right off our shore. You can see them from shore. If those of you in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can see them right from the Golden Gate Bridge. You can see them off Ocean Beach. You can see them around the, the, the straits of the San Francisco Bay entrance, uh, off Tiburon, you name it. They have made, um, they have never been hunted ex extensively. They've been harvested here and there, uh, but they've made a return to our area, which is uh, 
been an interesting development in a chapter in our story uh, that they came from the ocean to use, once again, use the bay. There is historical, even very old evidence that they came into the bay frequently. There, they are even remains in First Peoples uh, midden sites that they hunted or at least gathered these animals if they washed on the beach uh, in and around the perimeter of San Francisco Bay. So they were here. They were gone for a long time. Izzy and John and Bill and I never saw them um, in the bay for, for decades of work out of San Francisco and Marin County. Uh, and then until one day we did with John's uh, keeping his eyes open and finding them. So they're coastal and including inshore areas in, in even bays like ours. Uh, they typically show up uh, as individuals, small groups, mothers and calves. We rarely see more than 10. However, uh, kind of asterisk, uh, a colleague on our chapter just published a paper about gathering information about very large aggregations, for instance, in Washington in the Salish Sea, where they've seen many hundreds gather up on feeding opportunities. But the, 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 the key message is they don't seem to form large and stable schools like dolphins do. They tend to come and go from their own company and gather in places where uh, it appears food is conveniently available. And as I mentioned before, they are pretty shy and elusive and tend to avoid boats, which is where I'm going kind of a little bit next with the story. Oh, here's that range uh, that I've, I've mentioned sort of uh, through that other slide that uh, they occur throughout the Northern hemisphere, particularly in coastal areas, although you'll notice an exception in parts of the Atlantic Ocean where they do range out over deeper waters. That's relatively new information. Um, 2018 that that was kind of put together. But by and large, the continental shelf is their, their happy place. And that brings them in close contact to the coasts of the most populated continents on the planet. Uh, so um, they are under our foot and under our noses on a regular basis and have been for a very long time. Um, some of you uh, may be wondering what is the difference between a porpoise and a dolphin? That's a great question. Um, there is no one super easy answer. Uh, there's always an exception. Uh, porpoises are typically considerably smaller than most dolphins. They typically lack, lack uh, or they do lack a conspicuous beak or rostrum, although some dolphins don't have that feature. They typically, where they have dorsal fins, they're triangular, and dolphins tend to have, as you see in the lower picture, more of a hooked or called falcate dorsal fin. And then other significant differences that uh, uh, taxonomists would tell you would it lie in the, the way the skull structure is organized. And in particular in the dentition, does all porpoises have more blunted or spade shaped teeth kind of rounded and squared off at the top. Whereas dolphins have, uh, well, their teeth are healthy. They have conical or pointed teeth. Uh, they are, are quite different in that regard in, in the nature of their teeth. And that plays into something about porpoises and understanding them. As you see in the lower picture, the dolphins have scratches and rakes on their bodies. They do that to each other as part of their social interaction. Porpoises don't have the dentition for it and they don't do it. So we don't get uh, our porpoises as well marked up as uh, people who study dolphins. So it's just a little harder to track them as individual, quite a bit hard, individuals quite a bit harder because they don't uh, rake each other in social encounters. Um, they don't have the teeth for it. So here they all are. Um, you can see them now together with their different, uh, when there are differences between females and males, uh, an issue in uh, each of the calves. There's an interesting picture in the lower area that's a hybrid variety where harbor porpoise here and dolls porpoise um, have hybridized in Washington state waters. And this is what an example of one of the hybrids uh, looks like. So you have two finless porpoises, uh, two oceanic, uh, infamous porpoises of Asian and Indian Ocean waters, two oceanic porpoises, one of the North Pacific, one of the Southern Ocean, uh, the doll's porpoise and the spectacled porpoise. You have a, a, an endemic species to the Gulf of California called the vaquita in very, very dire straits conservation wise. You have a coastal porpoise of South America, the Burmeister's porpoise, and you have our harbor porpoise right here. So all in all, you have uh, seven different kinds of porpoises in the world, all in their own family, the Phocinidae, uh, and separate from all ocean dolphins, which are in the Delphinidae, a much larger family. Well, so um, we um, start this story a little ahead of ourselves, but the harbor porpoise returned to San Francisco Bay after it was absent for more than 60 years. Um, we don't entirely know why. We have some ideas about that. Uh, for instance, in the 19th century, uh, there was significant construction going into the 20th century when they were blasting spires and rocks. They're 
uh, were, was major bridge construction in the early 20th. Uh, there was an, obviously a major war, which uh, although our shores weren't uh, bombarded much, there were a few things happening, but massive submarine nets were employed to protect harbors from enemy intrusions. And, uh, and and attacking of, of, of merchant vessels. And these nets were enormous, heavy metal structures that uh, probably created an enormous sound racket in the ocean, which un undoubtedly drove the porpoises away from this habitat, or even if not kept them from it uh, or trapped them within it till they died. Uh, they, it seemed to us like a very much an impassable barrier. But since then, uh, the bay has gotten a lot cleaner starting in the 1970s with environmental protection laws. Um, we uh, also have experienced multiple uh, oceanic regime shifts that might favor the colder water porpoise uh, over time. And um, we even speculate that porpoises uh, having such short life expectancies may have um, uh, literally lost the institutional knowledge to using this habitat and came back to it once they were following good foraging opportunities and good waters. So it's very likely that just exploring porpoises uh, made their way back to the bay. We'll, we'll probably never know the full answer to that, but we did write a, a paper about their return, which got us started on our studies of porpoises after Izzy's work in the Gulf of the Farallones. And here's Bill doing his thing and what he call, likes to call his, uh, his office on the Golden Gate Bridge, taking uh, pictures of uh, a couple of harbor porpoises. This platform, the bridge, we got to it before drones or UAVs became the way to go to study these animals vertically and um, found out that you could take amazing observations from this platform. The animals were moving along underneath it undisturbed unless a vessel came by, but otherwise they just kind of went about their business and we weren't bothering them. And all of our experiences before this with porpoises really pretty much had come from boats. And when we we're out with them in boats, they they move away. They stop what they're doing and they get away from you. Uh, so um, we, and I'll get to that in a second, we, um, uh, didn't learn a whole lot. We learned a little bit about group size. We learned a lot about the fact that they don't like us very much around them. And um, and that's about it, except from carcasses. Uh, it was very, and where they like to be, we knew physically, geographically where they were. But uh, as far as intimate details of their behavior, we didn't have them, very many of them. So the Golden Gate Bridge sits astride the narrows uh, of the entrance to San Francisco Bay. And it's a very energetically uh, active ocean or water space. That is to say the tides that flow back and forth carry vast amounts of water, create huge amounts of turbulence, eddies, currents, rips, and porpoises love it. They like this habitat. They love to be on the edges of it, foraging, traveling, uh, their mating behaviors, their activities. They use this flow of water to their advantage, coming and going on it, with it, and uh, interacting with each other along the way. So one of the first things we noticed, uh, we'd seen calves, of course, uh, in groups offshore, but we really didn't get the chance to appreciate the calf mother relationship very much uh, and how long it lasted. Here you see in the upper right, a newborn. They have a kind of an interesting color uh, right after birth where their heads are darker and their small bodies are a more of a, a lighter gray than the fin and the head and the flippers, but they quickly mature and start to look a lot like a small version of mom who they stay with for nine or 10 months and here is something we never saw from a boat. We see a, a, a calf in the lower right in what we call an infant position. Uh, it's, it's, it serves a multiple multitude of purposes. One is it's probably how the calf gets access to nursing opportunities on the mother's ventrum, but also it's probably slipstreaming along her side, as is this calf. If you ride with your mother just in the right spots, you get pulled along. The water actually starts to, as she moves through the water, creates a backflow of water along her body wall from her midpoint uh, <clears throat> forward. And the calf gets into that space and actually saves energy by traveling uh, close alongside its mother. And this you see actually in other cetaceans as well. But it's a kind of a version of a, a bit of a slipstream effect and efficiency effect for the, the youngster. Um, I had a video of this for you, and I'll just say now, some of the videos I hope to show you aren't really working. I'm, we're sort of dealing with some technical difficulties. I am in Alaska. Our university uh, internet system crashed, so I'm on a hot spot. So when you see future videos, uh, you will see some choppiness, for which I apologize, but I think you can still see what we're trying to show you. Um, but here is something that I, if you'd asked me years and years ago, do porpoises ever do anything associated with ships? I would have said, nope, they get away as fast as they can, as I've said a couple of times. Here you see a mother and a calf riding through a large uh, freighter type ship's uh, wake. And they surf this for several hundred meters, just gliding through this breaking wake. 
uh, using its energy to travel along. So they got in behind the big ship, uh, snuck in and, and hitched a ride. So that was a, a fun notice from the bridge. We also got to see things about foraging. Um, we'd never seen really any foraging from the surface perspective on boats, but uh, from the bridge, all kinds of things began to materialize. And this is a, a fun picture I really enjoy of a porpoise on the last part of a chase down on a fish. Uh, they used bubble bursts during foraging activities, uh, which we didn't know anything about because we couldn't see down in the water. Uh, here's a video. I hope it's working well enough. There's a small fish darting around with two porpoises kind of playing cat and mouse with it. I, I think they're mostly interested in chasing it rather than eating it. But uh, maybe you've seen some of these really interesting and acrobatic swimmers turns in this video that um, uh, we had no idea that they were how their agility and mobility in the water. As we saw them, they were just either surfacing slowly or scooting away from us. So uh, again, eye-opening experiences to see them from the vertical perspective. Um, we had the great pleasure of having some pretty cool photographers join us periodically. Flip Nicklin from National Geographic comes out for a day or two. And of course he gets the best picture we ever saw of uh, the inter interactions and relations of birds, seabirds, porpoises, and their foraging with on fish. There's a fish in the foreground there, right in front of the porpoise. The gull, uh, the gull pelican is sizing it up. Uh, we saw cormorants chasing after porpoises underwater. We saw mini gulls overhead. And again, if you'd asked me years ago, are there any associations between birds and porpoises? And I would have said, well, not that I've seen, not in the Pacific. Some people in the Atlantic are now seeing it quite a bit of it with their drone operations, and they may have always. But here in the Pacific, it was, again, we disrupted this. It probably was, and we disrupted the behavior with our boats. And whatever was happening stopped, the birds dispersed, the porpoises exited, and um, we uh, we didn't have much to see. But we did get some uh, opportunities to collaborate with one of our co-authors on our book chapter and uh, a good, great friend and and um, and uh, excellent scientist from Washington, Cindy Elliser, who uh, we collaborated with on some uh, cases, some information about foraging. We, we really didn't have the opportunity to put together without at least some of our, our bridge perspective. Here in the left, you see the front, the porpoise in the foreground has a fairly large fish in its mouth. That's an invasive species called um, an uh, American shad. And it turns out these things are just a little too big to usually swallow. And they have roughened scales that hang up in the porpoise's throat. And that has led to asphyxiations. And it also turns out that the porpoises that try and go after shads are the adult females. Uh, possibly because of the nutritional issues they face raising calves in short times spans. Uh, and it does sometimes lead to their ruin to go after these big fish. And these are an invasive species. So there's an issue there in a certain way with conservation, although shad are, have been in the North Pacific for a long time now, more than a century, maybe even, even two. Uh, but nevertheless, porpoises are still having negative, our porpoises are having negative interactions with them. So we wrote that up from both observations and from stranding records. And then here on the right, you see a porpoise going after a pretty large fish. And uh, it turns out that Cindy and her team uh, documented salmon foraging in Washington. Uh, we saw it in uh, some stranded, a stranded animal in uh, Alaska and also some very large prey uh, attempts in San Francisco. So we're also able to get a, a paper, a short paper out on that, that again, porpoises were thought, well, they, they eat small schooling fish. They eat a wide, wide variety of fish, but they're generally small, easily swallowed small things. And nope, they go after some big stuff too when they get the chance. So new insights there. So we, um, we launched uh, early on a photo ID effort, recognizing that there's a lot of variety in how these porpoises appeared to us, again, that we had difficulty appreciating from the surface view. So we saw massive scars on some individuals, like maybe an old line or net wound. We saw weird color variations. You'll see another one of those in a second. Uh, body deformities, like this individual here with a deformed back, it would seem like a scoliosis kind of effect. And interesting angled scars whose origins we have no idea of, but suggest something interesting going on, maybe with an anthropogenic effect or possibly Bill's idea, maybe birds crashing down on them like big pelicans with their beaks and claws. But it, nevertheless, um, these animals were identifiable. And when our, our partner, Cindy, published a wonderful paper on this in Marine Mammal Science. And it is the fact that using combinations of these things plus fin shape and the natural markings, which I didn't show here, color markings in the chest area, you can in fact photo ID porpoises. It had never been done before, never attempted. And so congratulations, Cindy, for getting the world going on that. This is a particularly unique porpoise we saw from the bridge, or a type of porpoise. It's leucistic. That means its dark pigmentation is replaced with white. It's not an al albino, truly, but rather leuc leucicism. 
is the case here. And we saw two different ones. Uh, this is Mini Moby 1 and Mini Moby 2. Uh, and so uh, we got a little paper out about that because it's been seen in here and there around the world, but um, uh, still interesting enough to warrant uh, getting out there for the for publication as it's being seen in different ocean basins and in different populations. But they're su super striking animals. And one of the first questions people ask is, well, aren't they con totally conspicuous to predators? And the answer, I guess, is probably, but these are both adult animals. And so they're doing fine. They were doing fine at, to that point. Uh, they lived their lives and they, they were born this way. That's the nature of this condition. And they grew up and made it to adulthood. So far, so good, at least in the time we saw them. And they seem to be hanging around with other porpoises too, a bit. So they weren't they weren't outcasts either. It didn't appear. Um, so um, then um, along the way, we started to see some interesting stuff, like some jumps and breaches. And again, the story is well, do porpoises breach? Harbor porpoises? And the answer is well, no. Sometimes they make a big splash. I mean, we had not seen it. Um, and what is that? So Bill took this picture back in two thousand ten. And we like, what is going on right there? And so we enlarged it. We went, oh my God, um, would you look at that? There's a porpoise airborne and what's happening? Is, is Are his guts coming out? What What is that? Well, obviously quickly we learned or figured out that it was his penis. This is a female porpoise that he flew by and got airborne after passing by um, in what we later learned to be a mating attempt. But um, this was a pretty... Uh, pretty uh, jaw-dropping day for us with this first discovery that, um, and through Bill's photo, a wonderful photograph, so from the bridge. Uh, and that launched a journey uh, into uh, mating because then we said, well, wait a second. We didn't know anything about it then. We said, well, how do small cetaceans mate? Well, the answer is um, here you see some dolphins. It's belly to belly in most small cetaceans. This is a male on the bottom here. If you can see them, that's not a reflection. That's a a male long beak common dolphin, and and uh, somebody illustrated the effect of it. So they're they're going to their mating, uh, uh, doing their mating through belly to belly contact. So we thought, well, wait a second, well, aren't porpoises mating belly to belly? Uh, what's this guy doing flying in the air? Um, so questions poured in, and we went in deep into the literature. We went back to 1918 and looked at some of the 18, uh, the early anatomy uh, gathered up by some of these, you know, sort of post Victorian or Victorian people who were big into anatomy. And, and sure enough, they described the very long male penis in this species, very large testes, at least seasonally. And um, uh, I love the quote. We both, we all love the quote here. Uh, but uh, the discovery was on. We were, we were having fun figuring this out. We also learned that uh, harbor porpoises um, uh, have um, mega testes. That is that there are seasonal enlargement of their testes to the point where they rival the testes of a fin whale in size. So you whale watchers who think you're looking at big old blue and fin whales, keep an eye on the lowly harbor porpoise. Um, they uh, they seasonally have enormous testes to support, support their reproduction, which it turns out uh, involves sperm competition inside the female's body. So the purpose of these seasonally enlarged testes, which are driven by hormones, is for males to compete not by fighting each other, but by inseminating the female with as much sperm as is possible in a mating event. And the competition happens within her body, which also has some, I'll use the words twists and turns. Uh, it'll come up in the story in just a little bit. So here again is another video of mating. Hope it's not too choppy. You just saw it, that's real time. That is how short it, a, a thing it is. And that female threw her flukes at that male who flew by her on her left side. Keep that in mind. That's a really key thing about that video. I hope that, uh, Susan, I don't know if you can speak up. Did, did, did that come through reasonably well? Should I try and play it again? Yeah, it was so fast. You might want to play it again. <laughs> sure. Um, so here you are. Here she is. This is real speed. I think it's starting from the beginning. And the penis is out on that male. If you look carefully at his belly when it goes slow. So he's flying by here from below coming up underneath and on her left and crashing back in the water. In the meanwhile, she is totally smacking at him with her tail flukes, which is a response that is not uncommon in the females, is to throw about as much commotion as they can as they're ambushed at the surface during their breathing cycle. And this male comes flying by and attempting to mate with them in an ambush kind of style. And their immediate reaction often is to, well, it's a varied reaction, but sometimes to throw their flukes hard and even smack the male and knock them aside. 
Um, so that we've seen all manner of them from totally nonchalant, uh, non-complacent uh, and non-reactive to that. So, so that all of that started us thinking, and there's a, both some data we knew and some data from um, our study that's uh, gonna tell you more about in a moment, but we knew that harbor porpoise is calved seasonally. And we assumed that their mating was linked to that seasonal calving. It makes sense. It seems to be the way in a lot of marine mammals for not only cetaceans, but even pinnipeds that reproduction is, is seasonally during optimal times for, for calf or pup raising. Um, well, it turns out that um, that's, that's true. That's a, those are facts uh, there about their, their seasonal breeding. And it's earlier in their Southern parts of their range and later in the more Northern parts of their higher latitude of their range. Like up here in Alaska, we get calves in July and later if you go further North than where I am in Homer, Alaska. Um, however, what we didn't expect uh, was that mating behavior, porpoise mating activity uh, and behavior is manifest all year round, even after the hormonal surge, even after the testes regress. Uh, male harbor porpoises are attempting to mate with females, or at least go through the motions, um, in every every season of the year, and uh, to a certain extent, in, a, in largest numbers in the winter when it would be somewhat unexpected, uh, so um, even more unexpected. So that was a question that came up that we wanted to, to address, uh, and um, uh, thoughts there range from uh, well, the, the key one really is is kind of practice. Uh, this is such a, 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 a timed event in the lives of these animals these males that they seem to uh, need to get it right. In other words, you saw what happened. The female came up to breathe and in a split second, he had his moment. He had to be there at the right moment in time, literally moment and um, pass her, get himself into position. And it's even more difficult than that, which you'll learn later, a bit later from one of our other projects, uh, our, our one of our co-authors and a lead, uh, leading scientist on, on cetacean reproductive anatomy, Dara Orbach discovered. So other details here. Um, uh, so uh, even though the males approached the females, started their approach to females on pretty much every side of them, something happened and uh, that we didn't expect, which is that every time they ended up on the left side of the female, as these two pictures demonstrate, every time, a hundred percent. There's not a lot of time you get to times you get to say that in in the in sort of the study field behavior study of, of mammals is or or any animals really that something happens a hundred percent of the time. They are highly lateralized in their behavior, in this mating behavior. That is, they only pass the females on the left side. And so that would become a lingering interest point and question for future work. Um, aerial behavior was pretty frequent. Uh, you can see that uh, there was non-aerial behavior. So this just means where the porpoise either contacted the female directly, bumped into her somehow, or got so close as we assume he even possibly successfully mated, or just barely grazed, or, or didn't get a chance to touch her, but tried to get in position, but she jinked away. And then um, there are instances where the males didn't appear to have a, a, a mating interaction, but rather uh, displayed as they passed by females, which actually were largely underwater, entirely underwater. But you can notice that most efforts where contact was made or attempted uh, involved um, aerial behavior by the male. Once again, the only aerial nature of the female's behavior is to get either turned around, do a cartwheel, or throw her flukes. She never really jumps in response. She spins and rolls and evades and getting some parts of her body in the air, but she doesn't ever fully leave the water or even mostly leave the water as do the males on these highly energetic uh, passes where they get either mostly or entirely in, in the air. Um, okay, so the females um, then and the males, the males approached um, females at the surface extensively. It seemed to us like this was a point of constriction in the, in the system. In other words, the female, she can't go anywhere else. She's at the surface, she's breathing. She's kind of locked into her surfacing role to get a breath. She can't go up, she could go down, but the male coming from underneath is, you're not gonna avoid him easily by going down. So he uh, is using that opportunity and she is in a position of, you might say some vulnerability to this approach um, uh, just because there's nowhere to go. So males targeted females in that position uh, for their uh, contacts and uh, where they even failed at contacting, they targeted them. Whereas um, displays were uh, more varied. Uh, and here is an example of what we mean by display. Here's a male with his erect penis. Here's a mom, a calf, and he's just kind of doing a pass by of the pair, uh, but never really reached the mother to, to contact her or interact with her or in any other more direct way than this 
apparent display to us at display. And there's a novel contact effort. A young male uh, hooked his pectoral flipper on a female's dorsal fin and kind of hitched a ride briefly. So that was a, a, di a different kind of contact that uh, we uh, had never seen before and didn't expect. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, my mouse is getting a mind of its own. So composition was generally males approached uh, individual females. Remember, I told you small groups, uh, mothers, calves, individuals, uh, and, and then some groups. Well, most of the male approaches were made to individual adult females, uh, occasionally with calves, and then very rarely uh, in groups like this one that you're seeing here where there's one or more additional adults. Here you have a calf, the male, the female reacting in this case uh, quite a bit, and a, a stand standby per, uh, dog porpoise. Now, um, uh, the other thing interesting about these cases where there were other adults, they were never involved. They never approached the female after the male. It was never clear what their sex was, um, but they they just were there and maybe traveling with the female and her calf, but they weren't there to to compete with the male, to, to, to fight with him, to interact with the female after him, um, the known male, that is. And we, we started to identify males as known because of behavior, but also in seeing the penis out of the body. Uh, and then with females, by their behavior and the presence of a, when they were there of calves, um, because in these small cetaceans, there's nothing in none of the species is there any evidence that male parents have any involvement with their calves, um, like escorting them around and such. So those were assumptions we made. Here are a few, we only saw a few uh, events where we felt they were comp uh, uh, copulations where uh, actual um, intermission happened. Here you see uh, that is a small calf, very small calf moving off in another case. Again, note, once again, the male is on the left. Uh, you'll see that throughout the, the talk tonight. So um, after a, a number of years of work, quite a few years, um, we, our group uh, published this. Dara joined us uh, because she did all the female behavior uh, and contributed quite a bit to us there and some of the male analysis, male behavior analysis. Uh, we're pleased to have her. And then our local group in the uh, San Francisco area, uh, including Izzy at the time, we're very pleased that he could be involved in this one. Um, got a chance to publish our results and um, enjoyed the reception it received because really a lot of porpoise people had studied these animals all over the world and really hadn't figured, seen anything like this or had a, a, an inkling about much of it or any of it to be, to be quite honest, a little bit from captivity, but uh, in Europe where some porpoises are kept in captivity. So let's look at some work Dara put together. Um, there's uh, obviously a male on the left and you can see the structure uh, of his penis pretty clearly. Sorry about that. It uh, is me tricking my mouse uh, with my hand. Um, uh, the one point to make here is there is a bit of um, probably drag as he's moving through the water. So the soft end of his penis, which is held inside the body uh, in a very stiff manner, uh, is be probably being deflected a bit by the uh, water flow. However, note that his penis, this is important, is asymmetrical. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things going on here. Laterality, asymmetry. We'll talk more about that later. Dara uh, uh, created some replicas of various male penises from her dissections and uh, kind of reconstructed them with um, fixatives and uh, filling them with um, hardening materials to get that shape. I'm so sorry. My hand is sticking to my mouse. Um, and... Um, uh, so she um, reconstructed these, these elements so that she could study them in great detail, which was fascinating. Here you see a reconstruction, a cast of a female's reproductive tract, her, her vagina. Notice it's really twisted, spiraled, and convoluted. And the interior is even more complicated. So these animals have a very complex reproductive tract that um, uh, along with uh, and maybe driving in even the, the shape of the male's reproductive organ, um, have created an amazing, interesting situation of laterality and asymmetry, and probably, according to her, the way she's uh, thinking about this, uh, created a, um, a co-evolution scenario of a evolutionary arms race to control paternity. Get that one. Think about that for a second. So female, male evolving together, female body adapting or making changes that limits the male's effectiveness or making it more difficult for the males to inseminate females. And males that are up to that challenge uh, then are the ones who have the ch best chance for siring offspring. So it's been a kind of a, a back and forth co-evolution in this species, an amazing story. And by the way, 
these porpoises, because I've said it a few times, these harbor porpoises are the only mating behavior lateralized mammals on the planet. No other mammal has lateralized mating behavior uh, like this. And this is a, a case where, like I've said a couple of times, it's 100%, I just kind of, because I'm astounded by it every time I think about it, how uh, steady and consistent it is that uh, there is no variation to this. And really what it comes down to, you've probably heard of the concept of a of reproduction, reproductive organs kind of fitting like lock and key. It's probably a lot like that. It drives the position of the male alongside the female's body on her left side. If you imagine it, he's coming up from below with his belly to her left side at, at a bit of an angle. It's a very, again, timing and position or everything. And his um, penis is fitting exactly in her complex vagina in order to uh, achieve insemination. Uh, and it's even possible that she can thwart him after that because of the muscular structure uh, and back channels and pathways and blind shoots in her vaginal tract. She still may have the ability to thwart um, a copulation, an effect, even an effective copulation from causing uh, a pregnancy. That That's something Dara has, has talked to us about as a, uh, a possibility. So um, other aspects of these animals and their uh, bodies to do with their mating behavior are they're sexually dimorphic. Females are larger. That's called reverse sexual dimorphism in some of the literature. It's unusual in the mammal world. Most of the time, mammal males are bigger than their female counterparts. But in this case, the, the females are a good 10% longer and can, quite a bit heavier, probably to do with the demands of raising calves quickly. Uh, and males may be smaller to uh, en enable mobility and speed and uh, the ability to get into position, these complex positions. Um, and um, males do have uh, sexually dimorphic pelvic bones, possibly to support the reproductive organ, that apparatus. So their little arrow pointing to their somewhat larger, proportionally larger uh, pelvic bones than their female counterparts. Okay, I'm gonna use stop using my mouse for a moment just so I don't keep jumping around. So just to review before we move on to our newest work. So um, this is what we know or knew about harbor porpoises after that, all those studies. Uh, and it kind of left us with some questions like, okay, this is happening in San Francisco Bay. Uh, there's harbor porpoises all over the Northern Hemisphere. What the heck's going on out there in the big world? Uh, we knew there was reverse sexual dimorphism. Females are bigger. We knew they had synchronized seasonal breeding. We, Dara's amazing work revealed the asymmetry of the reproductive organs. Uh, the male's penis is large. We saw that early on in the images we showed you. Um, we knew from very older, older, much older work that there was seasonal enlargement of testes and mega testes condition and sperm competition. Uh, we also were figuring out, folks were figuring out that this was a polygenandrous mating system, which means that both males and females mate with multiple mates in a given season. So it isn't male dominated nor female dominated, but rather both um, sexes are mating with multiple partners in a given season. And uh, that key point of lateralization and the interesting observation that was revealing these things to us and we wanted to share with all our colleagues was that there was frequently aerial behavior, uh, which we were really inexperienced with. You know, you, you know, you just, when we thought about it, when did we see the porpoise jump? When did we even seen it out of the corner of our eye where there was a big splash over there or even to think, you know, what you, you don't know to think about, you don't often think about, right? You don't, you know, that big splash, oh, that was a sea lion or that was something else. Couldn't have been a porpoise. They don't do that. So um, a lot of, I think probably a lot of colleagues probably dismissed uh, out of the corner of their eye splashes as, well, that, that's not porpoises. They don't do that. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, make anybody feel bad because I did it. We did it ourselves. We just had no idea until we had this vantage, this Golden Gate Bridge, and we could see this whole thing unfolding beneath us and could even predict where it was going to happen because we saw those porpoises swimming towards the bridge and animals following and coming up and we could time it and see it in ways we never thought really possible. So we were big bridge advocates in research. <laughs> Little did we know that our giant oversized Zeppelin of a bridge would be replaced by handheld UAVs in a matter of years and change everything once again, uh, which is the way the world is going. So when we started to think about this more, we thought, well, how does the harbor porpoise fit in with all these other porpoises? Well, you've got two porpoises, dolls and spectacled, which are pretty much oceanic species. They live in relatively small groups, but they uh, have uh, sexual dimorphism incredibly conspicuously in the spectacled porpoise. There's no Nothing wrong with your screen. That animal in the lower right is an adult male spectacled porpoise with that enormous, strange, oversized dorsal fin. Um, uh, doll's porpoise, their sexual dimorphism is 
manifest in being a bit but larger and they have a forward cant to their fin and greater extent of white coverage on the fin and some other changes in the flukes. Uh, but so their sexual dimorphism is, is dramatic. But uh, these animals, these two types of animals may very well, um, males may guard groups that they're groups of females and try and keep other males away. And this may be either polygenandry or polygyny where males are mating with multiple females in their group that they're attempting to exclude other males from. Then you have two coastal porpoises that are very poorly known. One, just because unfortunately it's hovering on the brink of extinction, our, our poor vaquita of the Gulf of California, which is uh, you know somewhere way in south of 20 animals alive today, uh, where we know next to nothing, we barely can find them to count the few remaining individuals. Uh, and um, the Burmeister's porpoise, which is not particularly scarce, but is elusive and is not well studied living in the coastal waters of South America. Both of these porpoises, and you'll hear about the vaquita in a second, there is one thing we know, Darrow was able to obtain a, a male reproductive organ uh, and found out that it's exactly like a smaller version of the harbor porpoise. It is asymmetrical. So it suggests that these vaquita porpoise uh, may very well um, have similarities to harbor porpoises in their mating strategies. But other than that, uh, it's a, just a load of question marks about these two. Then there are finless porpoises that live um, in Asian and Indian Ocean waters. There are two main kinds. There uh, on the left, you see the Indo-Pacific type, and on the right, you see the narrow ridged type. Uh, the Indo-Pacific uh, is not that well studied in terms of its behavior and uh, its mating behavior, at least, uh, whereas the um, narrow ridged has been kept in captivity and semi-captivity for a long time, and there's quite a bit of work been done, and you see in the top picture, uh, uh, an oxbow, a part of the Yangtze River in China, which is cordoned off as a sort of a naturalistic habitat, large habitat space to protect finless porpoises in the system. Because you may remember our, uh, unfortunately, the, the wonderful Baiji perished um, and it virtually ex is considered extinct now, having lived in that river system and gone extinct because of development over there. So there's effort underway to protect at least the um, type of, of um, of a uh, uh, narrow ridge finless porpoise that lives in the Yangtze system. And as a result of that, there's quite a bit of work been done. And these porpoises do a lot of, um, uh, of their mating. They don't have the uh, asymmetries, at least in the male organ, and they mate belly to belly. And males may um, form coalitions. They may dominate uh, groups and keep younger males away uh, from mating opportunities. So they, they too, at least that one finless porpoise type, do not share anything in common like that with harbor porpoises. So we began, set about uh, finding people around the world. We knew a lot of people. We'd met them at conferences and, and workshops. And so we had a good start and we started to reach out to colleagues and say, look, hey, look, we just sort of published this. These are some of the things we found. What do you guys see? What do you know? And the uh, response was overwhelming. We, we had um, uh, data coming into us, um, 22 different locations around the world, 26 uh, partner agencies, uh, I mean, partners, individual partners, representing 20 different organizations. Uh, uh, and these scientists were incredible and uh, became good friends and, and colleagues. And um, we were so pleased to get to share this opportunity to tell the, the wider story uh, with such a large group. Uh, and so that's what we did. We asked them for data, we collected it, we co-analyzed, jointly analyzed it, set up teams to, to analyze aspects of the behavior, uh, documented where it happened. You saw the range, you saw this map before. Now you see it with where all these events have been documented around the world. Uh, a lot in Europe, there's some in the Black Sea. We were very fortunate to discover through one of our, our Danish colleague, uh, Magnus Wahlberg, uh, a fellow working out of Romania who has amazing project, uh, project going on with harbor purposes and had data on mating behavior, very conspicuous mating behavior observations. And he and the, and the key thing about all these co-authors that became co-authors and partners is their generosity, their willingness to be part of a larger scientific effort to get it all out there for uh, as a collaboration. And uh, I couldn't, again, be more thrilled and, and pleased and proud to have been a part of it and, um, and very, very grateful. Notice too, there are two uh, interesting outlying locations, one called Ott Aquarium in Japan, on the left there, and 
one called F and B in the, uh, pretty much the far right of Europe. O uh, Otaru Aquarium has harbor porpoises. And <laughs> this is how, how data gets to you sometimes. There were visitors at the aquarium who videoed harbor porpoise mating, uh, which the staff didn't have anything of. And they posted it on uh, YouTube and uh, somebody over there found it and pointed us at it. And so <laughs> by mining YouTube, we found porpoise mating data. It was much more uh, scientific and systematic for F and B. That's called Fjord and Belt. It's a research facility in Denmark run by Magnus and his, uh, his team of um, colleagues and students. And they keep porpoises there for research. And um, one of his uh, graduate students was a, a very um, a supportive partner. And she had been observing mating behavior in the captive circumstances, which we'll tell you more about in a second. Uh, so here are some examples from around the world. Now there's the upper left starts with an exception. This is one of those cases. And there's a bit of this scene elsewhere where porpoises seem to get airborne for no better reason than they can. Um, now, we never saw this in, the, in our part of the North Pacific, but David Anderson of Cascadia Research did in the, in the Salish and Puget Sound areas. Uh, this is a picture from the United Kingdom, uh, out in the English Channel area, where a porpoise, with no other porpoises apparently around it, is just leaping, and there was a lot of feeding going on in the area, so it could be something related to the foraging activity. However, the rest are all sexual interactions from uh, upper right in Canada, in the center too from San Francisco Bay, you've seen the picture on the right. And in the left lower is one of Cindy's pictures from um, Burroughs Pass in the Salish Sea. And on the right um, from Marian Payao in Romania in the Black Sea. And again, that this is representing all three subspecies of harbor porpoises, Atlantic, Pacific, uh, and um, Black Sea. And just to, uh, Pile it on. Um, here are more images, uh, just showing you some of the collection we amassed uh, and we were able to analyze uh, from all over. We've got more from the UK. We've got Maine on the East Coast here. We've got Monterey Bay, which we had done and had not done any work in, but very grateful to get that from Daniel Bianchetta, who works out on uh, Nancy Black's whale watching tours. Uh, whales in the UK, Netherlands, and here up in Alaska, I've got some uh, mating behaviors from our studies in Kachemak Bay near near Homer here. Uh, several cases now with my colleague up here, Debbie Tobin, who runs a study um, here in South Central Alaska. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna try some more videos. Cross your fingers, wish me luck. This is a mating behavior. These are all now from our colleagues in Denmark. Uh, Heloise Hamel is a graduate student in, in um, Magnus Wahlberg's lab and very wonderful drone operator. And she captured this for us to review and analyze. And hopefully, again, it kind of works well enough. And you can see the calf was lingering back to the left, was in, disrupted away from its mother. We're not sure if they got back together. Uh, we saw that in San Francisco Bay, but in most cases, the calf got better. Susan, is that was that good enough, or should I try and rerun that? Yeah, I think, and all of a sudden we're seeing a black screen, but I think it's well worth seeing again. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry. I can go yeah. back. Yeah. Oh, I, no. um, yeah. Let's see it again. Sure. No, the black screen was only because the video ended that case. This is the same yeah, video. I'm sorry about these technical things. So you, again, you can see the instantaneous nature of it. And in this case, disruption of the mother calf pair. All right. This is a very high energy mating event. Uh, captured also from the Southern Denmark University. That's Magnus, his home, his campus where he works. And let's get this one going. I'll just play it again anyway, Susan, just because kind of, you can see that one was a, a big deal, a big commotion, a hard hit. And you could also see possibly, I hope it was good enough. Here's in slow speed. The male's penis was out at the end as the water, the white water broke away or drifted away. You could see him. He hasn't fully retracted yet and he slowed down the female just disappeared she got hit hard and she's gone and she must have dove because we can't even see her in this relatively clear water so i'll just play that one one more time for you in case your various different parts of it get choppy at different times just a matter of bandwidth unfortunately on the internet Okay, um, now we're gonna look at some interesting, really interesting behaviors. You're gonna have to really kind of lean into your screen and look carefully. Uh, this behavior here involves uh, a mother with her calf. And this is important for a question we'll get to in a second. And I know I need to probably hurry up a little bit. Um, 
So um, there's a mother with a calf and the calf is making sexual advances towards its mother, rubbing itself on her flanks. And if you look carefully, he's uh, got a calf sized erection as he does this. There's a couple of parts to this, um, but he's, so it, it gets us to the question that's very keenly interesting to, to Dara, our evolutionary specialist. Is this left this laterality, is all of this nature or nurture? Are they born this way? Are they born pre-programmed? behaviorally to do what they do, or do they learn it? Um, and um, apparently this calf, we don't, but we don't know what this calf has seen. Its mother may already been mated with in multiple cases. So, um, you know, he, this calf may have witnessed mating. And so has it learned it or does it um, come from birth knowing what it's going to do as it, as it matures? And, or even as an image, you can see a little bit of the silhouette of the drone hovering overhead. Do we need to see that again? It's a longer one. Just let me know. What do you think, Susan? I would say so. I mean, it's all so fascinating. Of course, I'm thinking Oedipal complex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so um, now he isn't, he's making some movement to her left side, but he's also going ventral to ventral with her. So it's, it's kind of all over the place in his approach. Uh, but he does, if you look carefully, he does have a a small erection at moments in this in these intervals, and he does get into position on her left side. Now, this is the clearest element. You can see the water is beautiful over there. It's probably six meters or so deep. He, he, now, that would be simulating a very soon, you know, later in his life, a pass he might make uh, coming up from behind and then drifting to her left side and grazing by her, maybe a little more vertically later when he's actually intending to meet it as a sexual pass. But still, he got a lot of it right. Okay. All That's right. Fascinating. And then this next one is our first ever evidence uh, of witnessing of same sex behavior. So this, uh, oops, I'm sorry. That is the same thing over again. I didn't double click. Uh, okay. That's what we want. Nicholas McCaffrey. So we have a male, obviously right there hooking another turns out to be male with his around his tail flukes. Now watch that animal. He's got a white spot on his back. Now, again, another sexual pass on that same individual. See the white spot high in his back in front of his dorsal? Now, he's going to turn around and make a sexual pass on the animal that just made a pass on him. And we've never seen any known or assumed females make sexual passes. So there's a slow-mo of the one male hooking, and he, he reacts very calmly to the whole thing. So this is the first evidence that we have, which is very common in dolphins, to have uh, sexual behavior between same-sex individuals. Uh, very common in many species of dolphins. It's been documented many times. But... First time in porpoises. One, I guess I'll give it to you one more time there. Notice that white spot on his back, uh, the one that just got passed by. Now he's gonna turn around and do the pretty much his version of the behavior on the one who did to him. And there it is at slower speed. The original, the first interaction. And there's the spot. And then kind of they regroup. And um, well, okay, that's not part of the slowdown clip. But anyway, you, you get the idea. So then more data, data from Fjord and Belt, from a wonderful student there, uh, Freya Jacobson, who's working on her graduate program on training and behaviors of the captive porpoises at Fjord and Belt. And lo and behold, they have two females, an older and a younger, and you know, one young male who's just becoming mature, and they started to see uh, sexual behavior from him towards the females. Now, these females are in a little bit of an awkward situation. They're, uh, as you know, cetacean training speak, they're stationed at the side of their tank to their trainer. And this is when the young male makes his passes on them, when they're kind of motionless, unable to get away, or at least immediately get away because they're re responding to the to the, the 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 request or the stimuli the, the the training to stay put so he makes his move uh and then it turns out he they've got many of these events where he um uh particularly comes to um saga the youngest of the two females uh so that's his preferred partner but he has made it with both or attempted to mate with both uh and they have porpoises have given birth in captivity successfully so they are not constrained by the captive environment from from mating behavior or even successful reproduction. Um, now this guy, um, Eskild, young male, 
uh, he was caught in the wild as a as a calf, as was uh, in fact Saga. Um, so it's still it's, again the nature nurture question remains open. He wasn't born to life in captivity. He has uh, had much you know you can't say he hasn't witnessed uh, sexual behavior amongst adults. So that question remains open. But as he became sexually mature, started to become mature, he became reproductive or mating active. So here's some of the, the nitty gritty stuff. Um, these are dissections uh, made by Dara. And you can, we for this uh, paper, we were able to get uh, the first Northeast Atlantic reproductive tract to confirm that the all the animals in the Atlantic have these complex female reproductive tracts with many, the most complex vaginal folding of any cetacean, uh, many blind pathways. It's spiraled, uh, it's muscular, and it's channeled and uh, kind of uh, a, a crazy maze uh, for the male sperm to traverse. Uh, so um, it's, it's quite um, uh, a complicated uh, vaginal tract. And then on the right, you see these asymmetrical uh, penises, not models, not casts, but rather the lower one being uh, from a vaquita. And you can see it just seems to be a smaller version of a harbor porpoise uh, one on the right. You can see the asymmetry where the end of it, um, the tip pe uh, part of the penis is, is making a turn backwards and then forwards again, but on the left-hand side. So these two elements, these reproductive organs interlock and the positioning of the male seems to be uh, needs to be very precise in order to make entry and to actually get into the vaginal pathway enough to have any chance of success. So let's talk a little bit towards the end of the talk now. That's, that is what we gathered and analyzed for the chapter you now have a chance to read if you're interested in learning more for in the Sex and Cetaceans book. Um, and all the many partners that graciously contributed work and effort and data. Uh, so let's go back to what does this all mean? Well, I mean, okay, it's really interesting. We learned something about porpoises, many somethings about porpoises. We had no idea, totally surprised us, blew us away um, uh, that we, when we started thinking about these animals decades ago. Um, but what is it? Does it mean anything else to us to have this knowledge? And I think it does. And um, people have written about how these porpoises are sensitive to construction. They're sensitive to noise. Uh, in the water system, and even as much as 20 kilometers away, they will react to underwater construction noise. That has a lot of power to think about that, how far away they can be and still be reactive to noise like that. Nobody, um, you know, I, nobody monitors very frequently that far away from wind turbine development, uh, wind farm development, tidal turbine development, oil platform use and development, uh, dredging, mining, um, you name it. Um, uh, shoreline development. So we returned to San Francisco Bay in our thinking, and I want to bring you some examples of how this could matter. Uh, and um, so we know that harbor porpoises, we know we can identify mating behavior now. So we know if we look for it, we can find it uh, out there because we know what to look for. Uh, and so we can find out where there are important locations for mating. We also know uh, and have known, and, and people in Europe have done a lot of work on this, that areas where there are high densities of calves um, are probably re significant for reproduction in the species. So right away, you can think in your mind about maybe are these places, these areas where these things happen, potential candidates for marine protected areas like sanctuaries or parks or ref refuges? And I think the answer is yes, because the, nothing is besides feeding is more important to the survival of a species and its ability uh, to, and willingness to reproduce or have the conditions right where they're not disturbed, not harassed, not injured uh, or driven off in some way and are able to gather for vital life functions. So the San Francisco, this is John Stern. Um, he coined the Golden Gate uh, as the funnel of love uh, for harbor purposes. <laughs> uh, and um, he uh, decided in his mind that, uh, and I, I think he's got something here. I, I've always kind of resisted this a little bit just because it's, uh, you know, kind of a little bit of, fun meets science, but um, uh, that this is a constriction in arrows with important habitat. And the males very well may, a study, a future study could include seeing if males camp out in this location, this constriction where females pass for, backwards and forwards every day now, uh, waiting to uh, make their sexual approaches toward ambush approaches towards females. So um, to, towards those females. So areas where there's habitat, significant habitat constrictions may be significant for for porpoise mating activities and foraging. Also uh, in places like San Francisco Bay where the porpoises now have returned, we have to share that with them and we have to be very cognizant of their presence and, and practice 
safe boating activities, uh, possibly also be aware of them so that we don't disturb them any more than they have to be disturbed. Even though sailboats are pretty innocuous with if they're under sail, not power, still you want to not disrupt any naturalistic behaviors. And of course there is also the protection given by the Marine Mammal Protection Act to these animals in US waters. We, here's where the real concern lies. What are we going to do about particularly inter, uh, noisy uh, and invasive kinds of activities? You know, we need oil and gas, we need transportation, but how can we manage those and develop those in, in a, uh, with harbor porpoise habitat and, and requirements in mind? And I think that's gonna be an important element for managers. I think the harbor porpoise frankly gets a bit overlooked because of its being everywhere and its inconspicuousness and its shyness. But those are all the more reasons really why they probably need attention here in San Francisco Bay, there where you, many of you are, we have uh, high speed ferries, which are vital transportation hubs for the Bay uh, and its commuters. Uh, but we just need to know more about where these mammals and these ferries may have uh, crossover connections and impacts to better understand if there's ways we can manage them to minimize those impacts. And I already mentioned the whole sound thing with construction is a, is, a, is just a really, really big deal. Um, very direct impacts come from uh, boat strikes. Uh, here's a porpoise on the left. Sorry about the gruesome picture, but that's what an outboard motor prop strike looks like on a porpoise. This one came in on Angel Island in San Francisco Bay. So as quick and snappy as they are, uh, some boats are faster or a porpoise is distracted or unfortunately things happen and uh, they do occasionally get hit. Uh, and that's pretty much a lethal combination um, is the either the mass of a vessel uh, moving quickly or it's uh, hit by its keel, its skeg or its prop. And then here in Alaska, I just recently took this picture of a porpoise near some fishing gear and entanglements uh, affect porpoises, particularly gillnets, which fortunately we don't have in California. We had a big surge of gillnets in the 80s that was uh, controlled, managed and uh, ended, uh, which killed many porpoises. But gillnets around the world are major marine mammal and seabird killers, and um, porpoises are just often unable to detect them, especially when they're made of fine mesh materials like monofilament. So there are many threats out there, um, many issues to contend with. Oil uh, spilled is a big deal for, we always used to think of this as a big bird issue, maybe a sea otter issue, but in fact, learning from the Gulf of Mexico, the big spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and actually Exxon Valdez here in Alaska, there is impact and injury to cetaceans. There are impacts to mucous membranes, eyes, um, uh, volatile fumes are inhaled and cross mucous membranes, volatile uh, toxic materials. So it can affect these animals, their health, their welfare, survival even. And one case up here in Alaska, for example, is a, a specifically distinct pod of transient orcas has been declining and not reproducing since the Exxon Valdez oil spill. They're genetically distinct, protected under the ESA, and we will lose them because they aren't reproducing. And that all started after the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So don't take oil for granted with anything. Uh, I mean, obviously nobody does, but don't think it's only a bird or a fur bearer type of issue. It's something we all have to consider for marine mammal welfare. And last but not least, uh, I think, is this. Um, now, this may look like a sort of a happy moment, but it's not. It's a very unhappy moment for the porpoise. This dolphin has attacked it. This is something the bottlenose dolphins uh, do in various parts of the world, and it seems to be increasing. Uh, it was witnessed recently in Germany, where it was never seen before. It's been in the United Kingdom. It started in, on our coast in Monterey Bay. Our colleague Tom Jefferson and Mark Cotter and others uh, observed it and documented it and published it. Uh, we've now seen it. Uh, Izzy documented a case off San Francisco. We've seen it many times. Uh, that is in the form of uh, battered and raked bodies, killed porpoises are washing in. The Marine Mammal Center has collected many of those and published in that information. And an unusual mortality event was declared. Well, you're saying to yourself, well, okay, they're both animals of the ecosystem. Well, things are changing in the ocean. Bottles dolphins didn't live in uh, the waters off San Francisco over 20 years ago. They have been steadily moving north uh, we believe under um, the changes associated with uh, the climate, the warming of the oceans. Uh, and these are, it's bringing these two species into contact in ways that really didn't happen very often before, starting in Monterey Bay, uh, when, when Mark and Tom did their work down there, and now extending further north up into uh, the San Francisco Bay area and maybe beyond. There are porpoises from Morro Bay all the way to Alaska. So the minute porpoises, uh, excuse me, dolphins, California coastal bongos dolphins to be specific, left 
pretty much the cozy confines of Southern California Bite and the waters off Mexico, they began to encounter more and more porpoises. And this one outcome is one of those. So, you know, this is a weird thing. It's a weird kind of interactive behavior uh, between these two species, but are we responsible? Is this all happening because climate is happening? Climate change is happening. Something to ponder. Well, that's it. Um, there's all the co-authors and more. Um, we had support from some permits for our work in the United States, uh, our close approaches that we made in various places in California and Alaska. And I thank you all um, very much for your attention. I'm sorry I've gone over a little bit. Um, happy to field any, any questions and happy you came. Mark, wow, what an incredible body of um, of work. So um, I think that chapter is going to get, or that book is going to get a lot of views. So, um, and we can put it back. It's at the, the first chat, by the way, the link to the book. So uh, we do have some good questions. So let me um, let me start. Um, okay, just some basics. Um, what is what is the gestation period? for harbor porpoises? Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, 10, 11 months is what's known about that. So there's a period, um, they're pretty much lactating and pregnant much of their lives. There's a gap in between right after birth, but they come to their estrus while they're still caring for the most recently born calf in many areas. Now in the, in the Pacific West Coast, we were the first ones to document um, mating, uh, calving in successive years, how it was thought that it was an every other year phenomenon in our area, whereas in the Atlantic, it was been well documented to be in a consecutive or a successive year uh, every year event. So I think you said that the the calves stay with the mother for 10 months? About 10, 11 months, yeah. And we've noticed from the bridge that they begin to become more and more independent, ranging off 100, 200 meters coming back as they get much older. Uh, in fact, you see a calf in this last picture to the upper a porpoise on its left. Uh, as they get to that size and bigger, they become somewhat more independent. We don't know anything about how they're weaned, but they probably just kind of go their own ways at some point where they're independent, strong, and healthy. So that means a female actually could be, if it's if there's it doesn't skip every other year, could almost be perpetually uh, caring for a calf. Pretty much either in her body or in the world out in the ocean and the water there, that female could easily be pregnant already. Uh, it, now, again, this is a Pacific picture, so we haven't got a lot of evidence of success, success of your uh, calving. And there's a lot of evidence that says it's every other year from the carcasses that have been looked at from things like the gillnet fishery. But okay. at least some of the Pacific animals are giving birth in successive years and almost all the Atlantic ones in their prime of life are giving birth in successive years. Well, that's probably a good um, lead into the next question, which um, from Michelle Smith, does not appear that females are willing participants in the mating behavior. You mentioned being ambushed. So that is I curious. Do, I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, right, that's a great question. Um, it seems like the males, I, I don't, we don't know because we don't have hydrophones, we don't know about the echolocation, we don't know how aware they are, the females are of the males approach from below them or in, in the water column deeper down. Um, so, you know, I use some, maybe I use some of those terms a little casually. Uh, we see a, a spectrum, Dara reported a spectrum of female responses, everything from that very aggressive fluke throw, knocking the male aside to, um, to extreme passivity, just very docile, even slowing down. So uh, it seems like the females uh, do have a grade of responses that uh, may suggest, and I think it's just some more analysis of this needs to be done, although it would always be difficult to tell, you know, because these are wild, range, free ranging living things, um, if any given ma male approach led to a pregnancy, uh, of course, right, that would be the hardest part, unless you maybe did some work in captivity and looked at hormone levels and when animals became pregnant, when mating events precisely happened, which there is the potential for at places like Fjord and Belt if with future graduate students in studying hormone levels on their porpoises. And as uh, Eskild becomes more and more active, um, maybe he will, uh, he and one of the females will, will have an offspring and maybe they can look at some of those kinds of questions about the female responses and what the results are in terms of uh, a pregnancy or not. It's a great question though. Hard to study. Okay. Are captive um, porpoises, do they live as long as, as in the wild? Uh, um, maybe, uh, Bill, if you're out there, somebody's out there can, I don't have that one. Uh, 
could throw it into the chat. I think they live longer, possibly longer. Um, uh, but uh, Bill, correct me or someone who's uh, up on that okay. particular but, point. But staying on mating um, in any case, um, with matings observed in captivity, are there vocalizations during the mating attempt? Well, we didn't um, we didn't collect that data. We didn't ask for that data. That's part of, for instance, in this case, our team Freya's analysis for her graduate degree. So I, I'm sure um, Magnus, her supervisor, our wonderful partner and head of that lab over there, is an acoustician, and I um, uh, I don't have that answer. So we can probably get it if that person would include a an email, or I could maybe point to her uh, he him at some publications about their acoustics work. Um, that is not something we we uh, we we looked at. Yeah, it'd be harder to get that from the Golden Gate Bridge anyway. Yeah, it'd be a long drop of the hydrophone. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Um, then uh, here's a couple that kind of go together. Um, the same, this is from Kayla. Um, the same sex mating behavior is so fascinating. Do we know if they actually penetrate or do they just kind of go through the motions? A and then maybe the, the corollary question there is, are the sexual activities used for social bonding, especially with the calves or same sex attempts? Mm, good stuff there. Well, two parts of my answer are, we only have the one piece of evidence of the same sex interaction. And we have the only have the one piece of evidence of the, of the calf mother interaction. Um, we have not heard of same sex interaction in captivity. Uh, it's possible somebody has some data on that. We didn't come up with any. Uh, and similarly, uh, calves have been born and survived in captivity and that may be um, an area for future research. But again, we didn't come up with anything out of that uh, circumstance. Um, um, now, um, interesting things about porpoises are, if you look at one carefully and you can Google this, there are some very interesting little denticles, little bumps, hard bumps on the ridge of their uh, leading edge of their dorsal fin. They're called dermal denticles. Um, the, the finless porpoises have a lot of them on that midline. There's even a depression on the back of uh, the Indo-Pacific that's kind of wide. On, well, both of them have a bit of it and loads of these denticles. Um, and they do rub on each other quite a bit with those roughened denticles. Uh, and uh, it seems to be some kind of sexual, social, sexual, interactive stuff. Um, now, harbor porpoises, I don't recall Freya saying that they did a lot of that with their ridges, but um, there is I, uh, actually maybe a little bit where they'll um, rub those fin ridges, I think, on a genital opening. So there is a lot of contact, some contact stuff, uh, particularly in finless porpoises. Um, I, Again, don't have a lot of that in mind for harbor porpoises, um, evidence of that or memory of its um, publication. But finless porpoises definitely, and we commented on that, where they have a lot of dental rubbing on each other's bodies. Uh, and curiously, a small dolphin called, um, or a group called the Cephalorhynchus dolphins, which you may have seen a or heard of a Commerson's dolphin, they have similar dental ridges on their leading edges, their front flippers, which they seem to, and they've been kept in captivity, Commerson's have, and they do rub each other with those roughened surfaces. Interesting. Okay, well, this is probably a good question from Nancy Black. Um, do dolls, dolls porpoises mate in the same way? No. Hi, Nancy. Um, no, they um, uh, they don't have, they have a very plain uh, female reproductive tract there. They don't have the vaginal folding. Males don't have the asymmetrical penis. And so it doesn't appear that they, I don't know that anyone's seen, maybe you have, Nancy, have seen actual mating dolls porpoise but their structure isn't the same. So how they go about, or spectacle porpoises, although I don't think anybody's even seen that structure, uh, how they go about their actual mating, uh, I believe remains a mystery, um, unless some, somebody who's out every day like you, Nancy, has seen it. I have not, nor seen any video or photos of it. Um, we just know that their structure is different, and we know that they're dimorph sexually dimorphic, uh, unlike harbor, well, in, in a different way than harbor porpoises with male size and feature differences. Uh, from females um, versus the other way around, female size and harbor porpoises, and um, that the males appear to guard groups of females and their young, and presumably to have the best access to those females, or at least to keep try and keep other males at a distance. 
And that's been implied for spectacled porpoise, although they're even less known, well known. They're very poorly known animal of the open ocean of the deep southern hemisphere, subantarctic. So you can imagine how little they're seen in the wild, not very often. Yeah. Um, so th there was a, a question as well regarding what's endangered, which porpoises are. We know the vaquita is the most endangered marine mammal that there is. Are there. Oh. Yeah. Say anything else about? Um, that's interesting. Um, well, not under the U.S. And, you know, the U.S. does extend its Endangered Species Act selectively to other marine mammals um, in the world, not just within U.S. waters. Uh, the vaquita is is certainly uh, endangered in under our system and under the International Union for Conservation of Nature, who lists it as critically endangered. We don't have that category, but um, we just have endangered or threatened in the United States in our law. But the IUCN has many levels and they call it critically as it obviously well should be. Mm -hmm. um, the um, um, narrow ridged finless porpoise of the Yangtze River was declining. And uh, I don't know its status in Chinese law, but they're doing these measures to provide extra protection in the Yangtze River for that group, at least, by trying to bring them into these semi-protected environments, these oxbows of the river that they close off and then manage them in a semi-wild, semi-captive state. But the rest, um, Burmeister's porpoise, Spectacle porpoise, Doll's porpoise, uh, they're poorly known in terms of their population numbers. They've never been really exploited extensively. Burmeister's porpoise are taken a little bit in artisanal fisheries in South America. Uh, um, and harbor porpoises globally are not uh, under that kind of threat. I was just expressing a concern for their welfare locally in places where they experience construction or human activity or uh, the risk of, of like oil spills and stuff from human in human harbors and such and along our, our shorelines, our coasts. They do mix with us a lot because they are coastal. We do encounter them um, a lot in our marine activities because of their, their habitat zone. Um, are you and team continuing to um, use the Golden Gate Bridge and is, is the suicide um, net been a hindrance? We haven't done much. Um, we've moved on to some interesting work with bottlenose dolphins and gray whales. Uh, there's plenty of good harbor porpoise work to continue to do, and I, I miss working on them. Um, the net is a bit of a problem. Uh, it obscures, you can kind of see through it, but you can't take the kind of video and pictures through it that we used for analysis effectively. Mm. Uh, so we have uh, slowed down, but what we're doing with the Marine Mammal Center is getting in position to resume studies in future years, um, as our program grows, uh, our, our, our field research efforts grow, um, because drones can replace the bridge and we can find these porpoises under the bridge or we can find them in other habitats where we know they are, mm -hmm. right, right here in San Francisco Bay, right there where you all are, many of you are. Uh, and uh, drones are one, I mean, you saw everything you saw uh, from SDU, those were all drone collected. So only thing you saw from the bridge was the first half of the talk. talk. Everything else, there's very little bridge data from Europe, a little, but most of it was um, boat and drone, particularly drone observations. Wow. Okay. All right. So we, we're getting to the end of time, but the, a lot of questions. It's been such a wonderful talk. Um, okay. Why is it there that harbor porpoises are in the Black Sea, but not the Mediterranean? They're considered a, a bit of a relic population there. They probably got there during times of different sea level conditions, sea conditions, temperatures and productivity. And so they don't really wander out. They probably are trapped there. They're more of a cooler water species, harbor porpoises, that is. Um, you may remember from the map, some of them range up into even polar waters. They, they occur off the north slope of the United States at Svalbard, north of Norway, uh, up way up the shorelines of Greenland. So they're a colder, even though they're small, they're a cold adapted, cold habitat preferring species. And I think the Mediterranean is just not good habitat for them. So they're, they be, they were, they've are they been isolated there a long time to the extent that they're genetically distinct, at least at the uh, at the subspecies level. And uh, Susan, I'll just throw in off topic of the question, just so you, about the bridge. Um, the bridge is still a wonderful viewing platform. It is still a wildlife, uh, great wildlife observation post and you can see things. And the best time to go out there is just before um, uh, um, the ebb. So in other words, the water in the bay is high, uh, it's kind of slack, and as it's turning to go out, the porpoises, many of them, not all, but many leave the bay 
on that ebbing current and come right at you on the on the eastern walkway and you can predict where they're going to come right under you almost you can move along the bridge walkway and get right above them and see some of these behaviors even if the and you could probably still take pictures it's just a little bit obstructed uh but um you can see these all these things that we showed you in the first half of the talk were just racing <laughs> probably looking like crazy people with jackets and hats and cameras running along the bridge walkway. I think the the, the, the bridge patrol police figured this out pretty quickly, but they, they kind of gave us the raised eyebrow for a while trying to, what are these guys doing with their are they, you know cameras and running along the bridge like this, like old, old guys do <laughs> running along the bridge. It's kind of crazy. So yeah, good, uh, <laughs> good, good to know, because that's something just about anyone can do. Just walk out there if you live in the yeah, area. Absolutely. Just time the tides. The tides are pretty important. Yeah. Best so you want you want the tides um, it's going out. To, it's beginning to ebb. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And anywhere between the towers is good. Pretty much. Okay. Well, well, maybe we'll just end with a rather, um, it, it, rather simple but rather interesting com or question from Roger Harris. How does the male determine that the individual he is approaching is a female? Huh. Uh, beats me, Roger. I guess some yeah. of the same. Way we do. Hi there, Roger. I, I I don't know. I I would you know somehow possibly it's vocal. You know, obviously vision isn't that important in the marine environment, and especially in the San Francisco Bay environment and a lot of coastal areas and colder temperate latitudes. Uh, so it may be their her vocalization. I'm just guessing here. Her vocalizations. Yeah. Uh, she may uh, calf vocalizations. They do approach. They don't approach. Um, in fact, the majority of the individuals they approach are, are um, single females, but they do frequently approach mothers and calves. You saw that. Yeah. Uh, but it might have to do with her, her biosonar and vocal repertoire. Uh, maybe his echolocation returns on maybe fine enough to orient himself to the features of her anatomy. Um, those are just just guesses, pure guesses. But um, we we don't know. Um, we, we were very confident based on ass our assumptions that we laid out for you all that either individuals with calves, we presumed were females, individuals where we could see the reproductive slits, we could sometimes see them. There is a different pattern between females and males and where we saw the male's penis. And so we, we were able to ascertain sex in many of the cases, at least for one of the individuals. And we didn't come up with a case in San Francisco where there was same sex interaction um, between males. That, that, that's what surprised us from the the imagery from Europe was that was, we weren't expecting it, but we we're excited to see it um, as new. It, uh, I mean, we weren't unexpecting it either. Uh, it wasn't unexpected either based on at least what we know about dolphins and their same sex sexual interactions. Well, we're, um, we're kind of at time right now, but it's, um, it's just been so fascinating. And um, just, uh, I think everyone has really appreciated it. And, there, we'll we'll get the chat to you because there um, are a couple good questions from uh, the um, marine biologist community. And um, is there do you, the best email for you, Mark, for anyone that might want to um, follow up? Please do feel free to, and yeah. um, uh, if I can send you some other papers that might interest you that are not open access, I'm happy to do it. I'm at Weber Two Bs M at tmmc.org, stands for the Marine Mammal Center. Weber M at tmmc.org, and remember two Bs in Weber. All right. Okay, well, boy, there's just so much to take in, um, and what a body of work, and congratulations to you and the whole team, and um, yeah, we will uh, we will persist and carry on, and um, I mean, so many good follow on questions that what you really do with all of this data to really help protect these amazing creatures. So yeah. well, I enjoyed it and thank you for the opportunity. And it's been a pretty much a career spanning journey with this species. And it's been fun to, to dive in and learn some really interesting things about them along the way. Um, and every chance uh, something new has been pretty darn exciting. Okay, well, with that, thank you all for um, for attending and hope to see you in a month from now where we're going to have uh, Jody Fridiani take us on a vo her voyage down in uh, the Antarctic. So, okay, good night. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody.